air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. The Anishinaabek peoples have utilized this land for millennia, and we would like to acknowledge their direct descendants, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land upon which we live, work, and conduct ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty relationship and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which include the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee, and since European contact has and continues to become home for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals, and each other in the interests of peace and friendship, and for the benefit of not only ourselves, but of our future descendants. So the technology for this call, I'll go over it quite quickly. Um, you're to use the chat box to ask any questions. You can find that in the bottom of your screen. You can privately message the host Simply choose the Halton Environmental Network or Oakville Ready, and we are here to answer any questions. Great, um, next slide. So please use the chat box to ask questions, like I said. Please take care of yourself. Share the air and chat box space. Question ideas, not people. Call people in, not out. If you need additional COVID-19 support, please visit www.halton.ca or dial 311. Now, I'm going to turn over to Trisha Henderson to tell us a little bit more about Oakville Ready. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to take a brief moment to describe the Oakville Ready program, um, which is kind of the platform in the program that has brought us here today. Um, so about a year and a half ago, the town of Oakville and the Halton Environment Network uh, set out to establish a neighborhood resiliency based program. Uh, we were generously funded by the Oakville Community Foundation and our goal was to establish six resiliency hubs uh, within vulnerable neighborhoods of Oakville. Uh, these hubs are to serve as a short-term refuge in times of localized flooding, high wind, power outages, ice storms, severe winter uh, events, or house fires. Um, this really is a neighbor helping neighbors program and we're trying to build community resilience and decrease the vulnerability of um, our population um, by building this community and this social network. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Oakville Ready program was put into place really to deal with that first one to four hours after an extreme weather event. Um, we are noticing an increase in the frequency um, and the severity of some of these extreme weather events um, that, as I mentioned, include high wind events, freezing rain, uh, general winter storms, flooding, um, and the impacts of these are often power outages, uh, damage to home property and in severe cases human life. Uh, so what would happen um, in the instance of just say a localized flooding event, uh, we would locate the nearest uh, resiliency hub which is a faith-based organization within town and we would open their doors. Uh, you would be able to go there to get a get some communication with the town on when this problem is going to be resolved maybe to charge your electronics get a warm cup of tea and really just socialize with your neighbors uh, we do know that uh, building community resilience uh, through this means really does help to relieve anxiety and stress of people that are going through uh, these emergency type of situations so our goal was to enact six hubs within the first year and we ended up going with seven. We had, uh, we blanketed the whole town and approached every faith-based organization within Oakville to take part in the program. Um, and we chose these seven as our first um, cohort uh, to the pilot project. Um, they were chosen based on their abilities to participate in the program. Uh, details about their facility and their location uh, throughout town. 
as I mentioned, this is a program of um, in partnership with Halton Environment Network and the Town of Oakville, but we have re um, received additional supports from Halton Region, Faith in the Common Good, and Crew. So I mentioned uh, Oakville Ready was put into place to deal with extreme weather events and our changing climate, but in light of COVID-19 and the requirements for physical distancing, we really have pivoted the program and what we're trying to do now is use the Oakville Ready program as a platform to provide a virtual community of support. Um, so we have been working with our faith-based organizations uh, and providing them some technical support to put their services online. Um, and not only their faith services, but also things like their book, cl book clubs and you know wine groups, things like that. Um, through our website and our Twitter account, um, we have provided a lot of helpful information on things to do to keep busy um, while we're all stuck at home and some helpful tips of where you can go to get some more information. Um, we urge you to contact halton.ca or dial 311 if you have any questions re directly related to the pandemic. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Nancy Robertson. Uh, Nancy, in spite of being a very busy and successful realtor here in Oakville, she continues to find time to give back to her community that she loves. Uh, Nancy sit on the Mayor's Committee uh, Leaders Roundtable and she is the president of the Chartwell Maple Grove Residents Association. Prior to moving to Ontario, Nancy lived in British Columbia where her love of gardening was fostered at UBC. Uh, she enrolled in their Master Gardeners program and she went on further to achieve a landscape design diploma. Nancy's Gardens have won landscape awards in British Columbia and her work has been included in garden tours both here in Ontario and out in BC. Gardening unfortunately has had to take a bit of a back seat to her as uh, her business in realty is booming. But as Nancy states, once a gardener, always a gardener, which is why she is here with us today to help the Halton Environment Network uh, with this gardening webinar. So we're going to begin by watching just a short video of Nancy as she prepares her garden uh, for the spring. And welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Lisa's on the video. understand. It's early spring because the magnolias in about to bloom, the rhododendrons have budded and you can see the purple in the buds and over here you can see the helleborus that are in full. Spring cleanup would include trimming off this kind of dead, dead plant material from from last last fall, and you would sweep, you know, carefully rake up the leaves around your perennials. You have to be very careful. Uh, number one, you've got to worry about compacting the soil so you want to be careful about trampling back and forth on it and then you also have to be careful that you don't step on any of the new buds and you can see that obviously somebody has stepped on it <laughs> one of the big spring chores which i find incredibly meditative is pruning this hydrangea on my right needs pruning at this time of year but this japanese maple will not be pruned at all, ever. It should always be left planted as it is. When we get to the back, we're gonna talk about garden design, but up here is a classic example of how you need structure in a garden. So we've created structure by bringing in the big boulders and the hardscaping of the, of the flagstone pathway. Very important part in a successful 
garden design is to incorporate some of that in with your plant material. It's never just about the plant material. So spring is my favorite time, one of my favorite times of the year. They're all my favorites, really. And gardeners will like every time of the year. But you can see where the sedum in the back there needs to have the old dead pet flower heads from the fall pruned off. And then if you come around, you'll see, you know, things, little bits of tidying like this to be done. And then, but the, you gotta love the spring. Look at the colors. And look at the texture, because gardening is about texture too. So look at the textures. Over here on this side, we have a very mature lavender bush. And, um, you know, lavender is almost not, can, not hardy here in our, depending on where it is planted in your garden. But this all can be plant, pruned off. And, uh, and then you're left with a beautiful shrub that will bloom, that will bloom later in the summer. So you can see we have a, a giant perennial grass here, one of the miscanthus. It was pruned back in the fall. It could be left through the winter time and you'll see one in the back garden that we left. Um, so this is all, the pruning is all done here. There's nothing more to do. You'll see some green shoots coming up. So at this corner of the garden, I just want to point out that the viburnum in the back doesn't get pruned at all. The hydrangea will get pruned. Now that hydrangea is a very mature old hydrangea bush. I love it to death. It will probably take me an hour and a half to two hours to prune that. And this is a lilac bush and it's about to, to flower. So we're not gonna touch that at all until after it's bloomed. And then if you just look beyond the red chairs, you can see there's a uh, miscanthus, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, perennial grasses I have. That one is unpruned, and I left it like that because it kind of is interesting all through the fall and through the winter. But now I've got to prune it back in the spring in order for the new leaves to to grow into uh, the into the plant. Let's continue the discussion about pruning, shall we? Pruning a hydrangea takes time. In fact, pruning most shrubs do take time. The general rule is 30% max. Uh, hydrangeas bloom, these are PGs, they're almost tree-like, and they bloom on new wood. So in the early spring, you prune them back. And you're pruning to control growth and also to encourage, encourage uh, blossoms where you want them. So this shrub has not been pruned yet. They were both about the same age, or same height rather. And you can see how I've pruned it to give it a little bit of room in the inside. So lots of sunshine and, and air can get in the inside. I've pruned out dead wood. And then I've carefully selected where I want the growth. I want a little bit of height and, and then I want the, to fill out in the middle. The thing about pruning is that, in fact, you're not pruning to keep it short. Pruning is done in order to encourage growth. So if you actually look at this uh, shrub that hasn't been pruned, you can see where I pruned it before. There's the cutting from last, the cut mark from last year, and you can see two branches came out from that cutting because that where I cut because there's two nodes on either side of the branch so you actually when you prune you're pruning to encourage growth and that's really important to know all right just for for as an example for those of you who are about to prune your hydrangea or your rose bush I know it takes great courage to make that first cut and I I, I know that from my own personal experience I I I have that same issue. So let's just give, as an example, let's take this shrub. And uh, two years ago, last year I gave it a very light pruning. So this year, 
uh, I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive in the pruning because I need to control the overall size of the plant structure. And it might take me, I don't know, a good half an hour to do this, this shrub. So I'm not going to do this for this demonstration, but I am going to show you that for instance, I'm trying to be aggressive here. So I'm looking at this branch. I'm looking at the branch in the overall shrub. And I'm actually going to take this back right there. And you're going to cut it on an angle right above a growth node. See? So it's going to actually, uh, two little shrub, uh, two little branches will sprout out of that growth no node moving forward. And then you're going to do that. Okay, so that's the first one. You're going to go up here and think, okay, if that's there, then my, I'm actually going to take this back, I think, right as far as that. Because I would like to, you can see it's quite healthy and all ready to roll. And then you go all the way through your, your shrub that way. This garden is a mixture of, uh, it's mostly a perennial garden. I do add annuals for color. I have planters that I always plant with uh, annuals and I will put blocks of color in, in the garden with annuals. Certainly we had a wedding last summer and we filled the garden with annuals. But for the most part, this is a perennial garden. So you can see that the plants have died right back and they're just starting to come, come back. People make a mistake when they're uh, doing their, their garden, a first time gardener, for instance, and they'll only put one of a certain plant in the garden. You, you need a little bit of size. So you gotta plant more than one perennial in order for it to look good. So to finish this very brief um, garden tour, I wanna talk about design in a garden because uh, there are some key elements to every garden and uh, it involves the structure. You have, to, you have to always put the bones into the garden. It's like a house, the walls are the bones. Well out here, the bones are the fencing, the trees, the evergreens, the pathways, and then in this garden, you know, we have red Muskoka chairs that definitely provide some visual point of interest. But you'll notice that we've got some evergreen shrub uh, he hedges all the way along that provides a really strong background to the plant material that's planted in front of it. And then in front of it, we have a combination of shrubs and perennials. And finally, one tip. If you're creating a garden where there was nothing before but grass, here's a very valuable tip. The most important part is you gotta get rid of the turf. To, to scrape the turf off is hard work and also it's, uh, it's gotta go somewhere. So my suggestion is that you plot out your new garden with a hose, cover it with some sheets of newspaper. And like, you know, you're gonna put a good, batch of newspaper down and then cover it with compost or manure and let the garden sit for you know six months so you're doing some planning in advance that will kill your grass the worms will bring it's a very um, environmentally friendly way to do things the worms will come up and integrate your your manure and your compost in through the newspaper it works like a charm I, I've done it over and over and over highly recommend that's all I have to say. I've, I, there's so much more that I could say, but I'm gonna cut it short now. Um, I'm happy to help, reach out if you have any questions. Please have a wonderful spring, enjoy your garden, and stay safe and healthy. So Nancy, we have a few follow-up questions for you about pruning. Awesome. Shall we start with that or do you want to start with a really simple question that was submitted to us earlier? Um, why don't we start with the simple one? Hello everyone. My name is Nancy Robertson. I'm happy to uh, help out here. I'm hoping that I'm able to answer all of your questions. And if you stump me, 
um, I will promise to look the answer up and in typical master gardener fashion, we'll look up the answer and then we'll get back to you. Um, the first question was, we had some questions. We had six questions actually submitted uh, prior to the, the, this webinar. Uh, the first one is actually so easy and it's so apropos. Uh, we were asked, what are the blue flowers that are, are blooming in people's lawns all over town? Uh, those are Scylla, Scylla Siberica, S-C-I-L-L-A, um, and they are uh, widely, they naturalize very well in your garden. Um, so, and I, I never worry about mine, I just let them go. I know that some people find it a bit messy, but once it's bloomed, you just mow it down and they'll come back next year. So I think it's a bonus in your garden. I love them and, uh, and I wouldn't uh, worry about taking them out or worrying about taking them out at all. Um, Helen, pruning. I had questions too, what are yours? Uh, yes, um, well this is just a follow up to your wonderful video which did answer a lot of questions for me but uh, we seem to have a couple of follow up ones. So one, how do you prune a forsythia bush? Uh, well forsythia is one of the, those uh, perennial uh, shrubs, a deciduous shrub that actually is quite easy to look after. Uh, you've probably noticed they grow um, very easily around town. Um, with forsythia, you almost can't uh, do anything wrong. Uh, you can you can be pretty aggressive with forsythia and uh, and cut it right back. It's it falls into the spy you know in the same sort of situation as a spirea bush. They get sometimes just uh, overgrown and they don't fit your space any longer. Um, the rule with, as I said in the video, the rule with most, uh, most pruning is 30% of the shrub at any one time. But I practice, um, I practice with my hydrangeas, my PG hydrangeas, I practice actually uh, a hard aggressive prune one year and the lighter aggressive, uh, lighter prune in year two. And that controls the growth of the hydrangea. For, for, for Scythia, I would actually, if it's, if it's um, you know, a plant that's gotten too big for its space, which sometimes they do, Spirea does that as, as well, um, I would actually be quite aggressive. And when you prune, prune uh, at least 30% of those long branches right down at the bottom. That will thin out the shrub, it's healthier for the shrub, and then you can prune the overall height of it and, and not worry whatsoever about uh, um, you know, hurting the, the, that particular shrub at all. The key is obviously do it right after it blooms. And that applies to most shrubbery. If it, like lilacs, you would never prune a lilac. My father used to prune the lilacs in the spring all the time just before it bloomed, it used to just drive my mother crazy. Um, but so don't prune the lilacs until they have actually blossomed. Same with forsythia and spirea, also the same. It will bloom in late spring and you're going to be able to uh, prune it right after it, it, it blossoms. And in fact, your spirea bush can be, you know, I cut it right, I don't even follow the 30% rule. I actually cut it right back because it's in a tight little corner. If I had lots of space with the spirea, the shrub is, is a vase-like formation. And so if you can let it grow to its natural shape, it can be quite beautiful. But most people have planted your, the spirea in the too tight a, a, a location, so they end up having to really give it an aggressive overall prune. I don't know if that helps at all. We did also get a, a pruning question online about a fruit tree. And this uh, particular Nikki, this is Nikki who was asking about uh, her, her pear and her apple tree that are espaliered. Well, let me tell you, that is a very complicated question, Nikki. Uh, with fruit trees, generally speaking, you are choosing between old and young wood and then you're also distinguishing which is a fruit spur 
because you don't want to cut off the fruits first. So um, that that is a question I'm actually going to follow up with you because I'm going to give you uh, a resource to to um, to look at uh, because online right now in this webinar it would be very 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 difficult to answer. Thanks for that. Um, what would be the best time to prune a holly bush? Holly, sh an evergreen like a holly should be pruned in the spring, early spring, you know, now. And for hydrangeas, um, somebody mentioned that theirs is quite tall and they haven't pruned it. So will that slow the growth if they don't prune it? Uh, it won't slow the growth, but what happens is that, I mean, basically when you garden, you want the blooms and the garden to be basically in your face. So if it gets so tall and the blooms are way up high, you don't appreciate them right down where at, at eye level. So that's my only thing about pruning. And that's one of the reasons why I keep my, my hydrangea at that, at that eye level is because I, I want to be able to see, see the blossoms when I'm out walking. I don't want to have to look up. I want to see them right at my eye level. So if somebody has a hydrangea at the correct height or a height that pleases them, they don't need to prune it? No, they don't, but they will get leggy growth. Um, you know, pruning is good for a shrub, uh, mostly because it gets dense in, you know, the, the growth is all on the outside of the bush. And that means that no sun is going on to, in, in the middle and you're not getting any growth from the center. Eventually you're gonna get a, a shrub that is, is gonna be what we call a leggy, you know, leggy. It's gonna, it's gonna, you know, just have long branching with blossoms only at the end. And that might not be what you want. Uh, I have one more question about pruning and then a couple of questions about bulbs. Um, somebody asked about cutting back raspberries. Ah, now there's lots of stuff about raspberries online. Um, and I also have a, a book on pruning that talks about raspberries. Again, the raspberries, um, the resource on ra raspberries, there's a, there's a little bit of two times of uh, raspberry pruning, in fact. You have to do a little bit in the fall after it's fruited, and then you do a little bit in the spring. So who, uh, if you can get the name of that person, I'm gonna direct them for the appropriate pruning instructions. Yes, I will get back to them, that's great. Um, so quite a few questions about planting summer bulbs. So are there any use plant now to have summer flowers? And any advice on planting them? Um, yeah, so mostly about summer bulbs. What would they be? When do you plant them? And any advice for the actual planting? Well, you know, the most popular summer bulb is dahlia. Um, and other, you know, uh, that would be one of, I think, and then the fall anemones um, would also be something. Most bulbs are actually planted, are spring, what people call spring bulbs, and are planted in the fall. Uh, right now, there is a small selection. We, we can't get into the garden centers, so uh, you're going to have to order these things online, and I'm not sure what it, what's been brought into the garden centers, uh, so I hesitate to kind of tell you what to, to do, but uh, I know that um, if you Google uh, summer bulbs, you'll get a huge list of what is possible, and then you just have to figure out what online is available through through the garden centers because you're not going to be able to go and choose. Um, other things that get, uh, so, so in terms of, of bulb planting, the dominant time for bulb planting is in the fall. Right, um, thank you. Um, is there a good time to spread grass seed? I'm seeing, well, this I've seen, and I know this is a question here, uh, isn't it too cold right now? Because I've seen a lot of my neighbors do it, and yet we're still having frosty nights. Yes, it is too cold. Um, it is too cold, but of course, you know, people have time right now, so I certainly understand and sympathize uh, with, with the enthusiasm in the garden. We've certainly seen, you know, people spreading lots of topsoil down and top dressing their lawns, but it is too cold. Uh, you know, in order for uh, any seed to germinate outdoors, I mean, right now, vegetable gardeners are, are, are doing everything um, inside still. Uh, you don't move it out, you know, in Canada and in Ontario, May 20, 24th is the weekend that everybody moves their annuals outside. 
Um, grass seed can actually go down, you know, earlier than May 24th, generally speaking, but it's the evenings that have to be warm and warm enough for the seed to germinate. It's all about germination of the grass seed. So if they, if, if, if it's too cold, too wet and too rainy, you risk that the seed will go moldy and just die. And it was a waste of time and effort. Um, or it just sits dormant until it does warm up, but you might not then have the same sort of level of success rate. So my suggestion certainly would be uh, to just keep an eye on the nighttime temperatures. Really, we have to be nighttime, you know, six degrees, uh, seven degrees, eight degrees, 10 degrees, uh, really for a really successful planting of grass seed. Um, now somebody asked about the benefits of a no-dig method for the, both a vegetable and a flower garden. So it's more not to actually start a garden, the method of it, but how is that beneficial for the soil? Why are they telling people to do, to not dig anymore? Uh, because when you uh, dig up a, a, a garden, you actually expose the seeds of weeds underneath. So one of the reasons why, uh, you know, people have gone to the no digging is because it's not, you know, it, you're, you're, creating work for yourself so uh, I you know and the other so that's number one number two is you risk damaging the root structure of of your garden so I, I don't I think that uh, believe it or not I think worms are the they're very or, organic and the organic will, or the most organic way to actually um, look after your garden is to really encourage the the worms to do the work for you so this introduces i'm surprised nobody's asked about mulch but we do have a question about mulch here uh, but it does introduce the idea of mulching and um mulch uh, does a couple of things one it tidies up your garden so if you're you know looking for uh, a way to really uh, make your garden freshen up your garden and really make it look sharp in the spring, mulch is a, is a, a good way to do that. But uh, the other additional thing with mulch is that it can provide um, natural fertilizer. So it replenishes the soil in your garden. And so you don't need to add an, an artificial fertilizer to give your soil, um, to condition your soil. And then a uh, third thing would be that when you laid mulch down at the right time. So if you've already weeded, you put your mulch down and if you're using a, a compost or a, or, um, you know, a well rotted manure, that will provide you with the fertilizer. But the next, the next part about the mulch, if you're using a cedar shred, which people do use cedar, um, you know, the blackened cedar, cedar on top, it makes the garden, they like the look of it, that will prevent weeds. So, you know, mulch is one of the, one of the best things that you could do for your garden on so many levels and and of course once you've got mulch down mulch down you're not going to be digging in your garden you don't need to the worms are going to bring you know the manure down in into the soil and um and you'll have you'll have done what you wanted to do and all organically um, were you able to answer that question about mulch do you want to segue into that and we'll go back to the chat box um, yes, well, good time. Or the, one of the questions was about timing on mulch, and it really truly depends on what you're trying to do. So I don't fertilize my beds every year, so I do not bring compost. And when I order it, I order a half and half mix of compost and manure. And I do that because both of them are, um, you know, provide some nutrients to the garden. And so the half and half mix goes down every two years in my gardens. And I, that's the only fertilizer, that's the only um, nutrients that I, I provide in my own garden. That's all I've done for years uh, can't, and, and it's been perfectly fine. So I, a, a uh, mulch like that, that is being used as a fertilizer, that kind of mulching can be done either in the fall or in the spring. It doesn't matter, you can do either or. The trick with that mulch is be careful, and all, and all mulch, do not drown your plants. Don't be putting the mulch up right to the, to the 
um, base of the plant or over the plant because you just don't want uh, to uh, burn the plant with, uh, with a, a manure that might be too strong. So I always keep it back a few inches from, from that root ball and, um, and really I'm fertilizing the roots around the plant more than I'm you know, piling it on top of the plant. So that's from a, a fertilizer perspective. From a uh, from the weed suppression and also it's not just weed suppression it actually cuts down on the amount of water that you need to put in your garden uh, that cedar cedar um, chips that you might be putting down and it's actually shredded don't use chips they're not that great but shredded uh, uh, wood mulch um, and there's various kinds it's you know cedar mulch is probably the most expensive. I think the most natural color is the one that's that's you know dark, as dark as possible the color of your soil um, that can go down you know in the spring and it will once you've weeded it will then hold it will keep the weeds out of your garden and that is a huge help for people perfect all right we better get back to the chat box it's blowing up as the kids say so um Ellen asks, over half her ornamental grasses did not grow back last year. She cut them back last week and pulled out as much of the dead material as possible. So will it come back? So, oh yeah, there's still lots of time for the green growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the only, and that actually, ornamental grasses was one of the questions. So let's just talk, somebody asked about Carex um, and just, you know, which is a sedge. Uh, ornamental grasses are awesome. I love them. Um, they do provide a, a, a you know, design element that people consider is more modern, contemporary look. Certainly if it's in, um, you know, if you do them in, in multiples and you've done a, a lovely grass bed, it can, it has all sorts of texture, it blows the wind. I just, I think ornamental grasses are fantastic. For the most part, they're in full sun. You know, they're out in full sun. Uh, the only exception to that really is Carex or sedge, which can tolerate a bit of shade. And I have, I have uh, sedge in my garden right in dead sun and it's fine. I water it from time to time. It actually is, I, you don't really need to care for them much. I don't prune mine back generally in the fall. My uh, lawn guy pruned uh, those back that you saw in the film in the front. I wouldn't normally have pruned them back. I would let them just die right back. And right about now, I would go out and cut off all that dead foliage. On Carex, on sedge, you don't prune them at all. You just pull out the dead, um, dead plant material. You know, the, you'll, you can easily just run your fingers over the plant and pull out some of the dead foliage without any trouble. But the big ornamentals, you know, the, the big thing with ornamentals is they do need to be divided every sort of five years. They get really big. Um, and it's a big job to, to divide a perennial uh, ornamental grass. Um, however, they are so beautiful and, and, uh, and they provide more than one season of growth. I mean, in the springtime really is their least attractive time, but then once the green greenery starts, it shoots up and, and you've got you know, summer, fall and winter where you have some interest in the garden because of that ornamental grass. So it's not too late, prune it right now. Uh, do not print it, prune it to the ground. I would allow probably about mm, six inches. If you don't see any green coming, coming back up yet, I, wouldn't, I would allow six to eight inches of, of, uh, at the bottom there and, um, and then prune it back and then be patient. It'll, they will come, they haven't died. It'd be very unusual to die. Thanks. We have a question on cilia, S-C-I-L-L-A. Yeah, which is, the, which is what we talked about at the very beginning. So this person is finding that it's killing everything around it. The root, root system is very dense. Um, they no longer have any pachysandra in the front garden. Could the root system kill other plants? No. Uh, what's happened is the cilia has crowded out the pachysandra. And that's, that's the only issue you have with cilia is that it can crowd things out. And that's when you would be a bit more aggressive. Um, you know, I have sweet woodruff, which is another ground cover. And uh, I do pull it up from time to time if I find that it's crowded things out. So yeah, you just, you'll have to, you'll have to pull out what you don't like. But in the lawn, I would let it go. I mean, 
you know, I would just uh, cut it back when the blooms are done, gone and you'd start cutting your lawn. Right, we have a couple questions about recommendations. So Anna, um, she would like to know if you could recommend a shrub that would flower most of the spring and summer that she could plant next to her deck that gets a lot of morning and afternoon sun. Oh, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> so when I make design recommendations, I, I always think about um, how much interest there will be from this plant year round. So uh, to me, a plant that provides a very short amount of uh, beauty, um, you know, a week or two, like crab apple trees. Um, I, I, you know, I don't find them as valuable in the landscape. They're good for certain things, but, but I like plants that actually last over a, a, a good amount of time so that they, they, there's lovely green chartreuse growth, for instance, in the spring. Then you get the blossoms coming in July. They, as they age, they turn, um, you know, they turn uh, different colors. So, and high, PT hydrangea fits that bill. That's why I use it a lot. Um, for a shrub beside um, a, a deck, I would say that A, it's got to get high enough. So you're gonna, it's gotta be a large enough uh, shrub. So a PG hydrangea will fit that bill. Um, so that would be one recommendation, I think. Um, I know that people like other things, but I always, I look at the, the space, you know, you haven't said how, how much space you have for planting. Uh, you can prune that hydrangea back. A viburnum, for instance, won't work because of the spread of the branching. And um, which, Segues to a, a point, um, a very important point when you're actually, when we do get back to the garden center, or if you're looking online to order things, look at a couple of things on the plant tag. Very important. You know, what is the spread and height of the plant that you're looking at? And what is its zone? The zone is important because it tells you how hardy it is. And uh, in Ontario, we do get cold winters. So you got to pay attention to hardiness. It, it, you can plant tender plants, but you, you're going to have to look after them a little bit. Um, I don't think roses fit into, roses are, um, you know, I would call them a, uh, a, a plant that requires a little bit of care. So beside a deck, I would say you're probably wanting something that's going to be um, easy enough to look after. And I certainly think hydrangea would be a good fallback. Gosh, I'm talking about hydrangea a lot, but and I'm sorry, but um, they're beautiful. Okay, okay, so on a different uh, line, are drip lines better for grow bag vegetable gardens rather than regular watering? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yes, I agree with you too. It's less uh, water that's going to evaporate or spread to places you don't want it to go. Well, and so that's the pro one of the questions I got was about rust on a, um, on a service berry. Uh, the thing about rust um, and and um, mildew, uh, they they are often caused by overhead sprinkling, and um, and so you really want you're better off not to sprinkle your gardens, you know, not to you know uh, water them overhead. Now, um, and that certainly means that if you're going to do it, if you're going to water that way, then you better do it, you know, in the morning. So it has all day for the leaves to dry off because it's watering in the evening and then going the, you know, the night sets in and the leaves don't get dry. And, and basically you can prevent a lot of disease by just being careful about when you, when you water. Good. So there's another question. Um, Anna would like to block weeds in her flower beds this year. Do membranes work or are there better things to use? Ew, not membranes. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I would go, I would absolutely use mulch. Um, absolutely, absolutely use mulch. And, um, Okay, great question coming back up from Andrew and Sarah. Hardy flowering or non-flowering plants to recommend for Ontario cottages? <laughs> ah, that's so funny. Um, 
Hi, Andrew and Sarah. For those of you online, this is my son and daughter-in-law. Uh, the uh, Yes, I think ornamental grasses in that particular cottage will work very well. I also think that um, a, a hedge of um, a, uh, a rose, uh, you know, a, a rose um, bush, not one of the fancy ones, but uh, a rose bush, a rose hedge would be also very pretty and certainly uh, a backdrop of uh, ornamental grasses would really look great. Um, I certainly would not do any uh, any evergreen hedging, like I don't, wouldn't worry about boxwood, it's, that's way too formal for a cottage. But I think if you did uh, something that would, uh, even spirea, a hedge of spirea would, would provide you with an incredible show of spring flowers, you know, white hedging of spirea. So um, those are a couple of suggestions and I'm happy to talk to you later about that. Um, before we, we, we go on, let, can we take one of the other questions that came in? Um, this was from Susan about transplanting uh, perennials. And she wanted to know about moving bleeding hearts and poppy plants that she's got in her garden. Um, so first of, all, first of all, let's talk about, for the most part, um, you can divide and move perennials in the springtime. Um, you got to know the perennial though, and if it's about to blossom, then obviously that's not the time to, to move them. You're much better to move a perennial when it's not in bloom. Uh, so, so for instance, um, the bleeding heart, uh, is a, is a kind of a early summer, late spring plant, uh, blossomer. So I would move it, um, after it's died back. So late summer, Early, early fall, I would, you know, div divide it and or move it and uh, move it into a, sh a position that um, is similar to the one it was in. Um, it does die back after it's bloomed, so um, so that's that's I would wait for sure until it's it's died back. Uh, the po you know, a poppy plant. Um, I, they have a tap root, so you do have to be a little bit more careful when you're when you're moving uh, poppy plants. Um, so as long as you dig deep, generally speaking, you're digging wider for most others, but as long as you dig deep for the poppy, uh, you'll be able to transplant it easily, be very gentle. Uh, that should be moved in, in September uh, because it, it blossoms through the summertime. So you don't, you don't wanna disturb it in the spring. It might affect the, the the um, blossoms that you get, and that's you know that would work against uh, what you want in your garden. Um, okay, sorry, back to you, Helen. Can you recommend a good ground cover for underneath maple trees with a dense, shallow root system? Uh, well, that's a really tough question uh, because uh, maple trees uh, really really take up uh, both the sh you know don't take up all the sun and they certainly take up all the nutrients and that's why grass doesn't grow there um there it depends if you're going to be walking on it uh you know on this space i i think the earlier suggestion of pachysandra is a good one it's an evergreen and um and so you're not going to get great blossoms from anything underneath a maple tree uh, however, the other one would be sweet woodruff, which has a very pretty leaf and it's um, and it has a very pretty white flower. Sweet woodruff would work really well as well and would look quite pretty. Um, but I wouldn't plant anything else under there. I would just do one plant and and do lots of them and do it in the entire circle around the tree and uh, and that will look will look lovely. Thank you. And this there's 33 people in chat. Is that how many questions are on the chat? No. <laughs> Some of them are just to thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so to follow up on that, somebody's asking what the best ground cover that will last in part shade, part sun. So they have tried Baltic Ivy and they've tried Pachysandra and neither have been successful. So you didn't have Sweet Woodruff. I don't know if you have one or two other recommendations. Um, I'm surprised. Wow. Oh, Ivy didn't work. <laughs> That's, I mean, and Pakistan didn't work. Those are like the hardiest and the, 
the, both the easiest to grow. I'd have to really um, think about that. I, the other thing about ground covers is that you need a lot of them to be effective. And so you don't want to buy an expensive plant. Um, the other thing I guess I would do then is if, if it was me and, and if it was a prominent garden, uh, like it's at the front yard or, or whatever, I think I would just edge the bed and mulch it with uh, some shredded cedar. And, and if appropriate, I would think I would buy a concrete bird, plant, bird uh, bath and put it right underneath the tree and make that the focal point. Forget about trying to grow something that your eye goes to. Just use mulch and put the bird bath in. in. Yeah. That's a design suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> or rocks, good place for rocks. Um, rocks or your combination. I mean, a rock, I always find that uh, somebody, you know, plops a big rock down in the middle of a, uh, you know, in a place that doesn't look like it should be, um, then you have to, you know, I think it's, you got to do something in combination with the rocks and you got to do usually more than one, like do three and then put some ornamental grasses and uh, yeah. That's sounding like a nice idea, actually. <laughs> um, so Margaret has both pink and white hydrangeas in her garden. The white ones have flowered every year, and she cuts them back in the fall. Um, the pink ones, though, seem dormant. They've only flowered once in 10 years. Do you know why that would be? Hmm. That seems very odd. Are they getting sun? That would be the question I have. Yes, Margaret, if you could type in if they get sun and if they're planted close together so we know if they're getting the same conditions, then we might be able to help you with that. So in the meantime, though... We if you need sun, I mean, hydrangea does need sun. I know that, uh, and I know there's a lot of people around who have hydrangea planted in shade, but if you want good blossoms, you have to actually, um, you actually have to give them a bit of sun. Yes, so she's writing now, some of them aren't getting sun, so maybe that's why. Okay, well tell her I will talk to her about that separately. Okay, um, we do have a question. Um, yeah, somebody else has the same hydrangea problem. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I think that for the most part, people, whenever I've been asked about hydrangeas, it's generally because they're not getting enough sun. And you, you know, you can do a couple of things. You, you can limb, if it's under a tree, limb up the tree so that sun comes in. Obviously, you're not going to be able to move the sun. Um, but I certainly, I moved a hydrangea a couple of years ago because I knew it wasn't getting enough sun. It now is much happier in its location, getting way more blossoms. So, uh, so yeah, I would definitely uh, think about the sun. And, you know, uh, for anybody, I don't know if anybody's on that's in a new garden, they've just in a new home. I think that's one of the most important aspects of, of, of your garden. When you're in a new place, you, you should really wait a whole year to figure out what it is that you want to do in your garden. Um, just because you don't know how the sun travels across the garden. And you got to be familiar with that. And funnily enough, people gravitate towards the sun. So you'll see, you know, people's lawn chairs are moving into the gar part of the garden where, where it's sunny and where they're most comfortable. Well, that's where you need to concentrate your efforts. If that's where naturally you're gravitating to, that's where your picnic table is, uh, whatever, then that's where you should have your patio, that's where um, you build out from that. And this is you know, basic garden design and trying to decide wh where you're gonna put things in your you know, brand new virgin garden. Right, um, we have a few more quick questions, hopefully we can get to. Um, Somebody was asking, uh, well, just very quick, are hydrangeas good for privacy if they're by a deck? No, not really, uh, because they're not an evergreen. And so um, the only thing you can really do on a deck for privacy is you can do an artificial um, privacy screen by building a trellis of some kind, that would be one way to provide some immediate privacy. And, and if you need overhead privacy, if you've got, you know, you've got an apartment building in behind you, for instance, then I would put an arbor on top of your privacy screen. And that will give you some instant privacy. Um, and then of course, the other, the other, 
and then you can plant a hedge and a cedar hedge works or a yew hedge would work. The thing with planting like that is that, um, you know, it takes time. It takes, it'll take years for a hedge to grow up and give you enough privacy, which is, you know, why so many people end up building a, a screen in behind to give them the privacy. They just don't have the time for the hedge to grow and, and become the, the screen that you need and that you want. Okay, um, just three more questions here. Uh, somebody has, um, is asking for advice on how to dig up a big root bar ball in the garden. Uh, you should have two people and um, and everybody should, you know, both should have a, a shovel and go as wide as you can and then basically leverage out uh, the plant. It's, uh, you have to, you know, it, it's, it's a very heavy root ball. I don't know what it, uh, perennials don't usually get that big. You should be able to to dig up a, a perennial. But if you're trying to move, I know people have tried to move Japanese maples, for instance, and you do need, you know, a very big root ball. And so if you have some somebody who can help, that's great. You're gonna need two, probably, um, you know, two very strong people and, um, and then, you know, slide it over onto a tarp and then drag the, the tarp over to the new location. Thank you. Um, are cilia's native species? Yes. Good. Good Even know. though they're called Siberica, they're not from Siberia. Um, Anna's going back to the membrane. So she was going to consider putting them under decorative stones or pebbles to block weeds. So is that an expensive option or still just not with the membrane whatsoever? The problem, so the problem with uh, the, the rock as a mulch, because basically that's what you're trying to do. Um, soil, your leaves, the wind will blow leaves in between the rocks. Uh, that will compost and create dirt. And so you end up with weeds in between the stones. And for any of you that have had uh, that kind of cleanup to do, it is a pain in the rear. So uh, I just think that you're, you're better off um, to do your weeding. You know, you can't get, get the, the garden cleaned up, tidied up, weeded, and then I would put down mulch and I would mulch then every year. And you can probably, you know, you can be weed free uh, effectively. I think the stone does create, it has a, it looks really great that first year, but then you will get weeds coming up from between the stones and that um, most people find that extremely frustrating. And um, since we are, uh, you know, being sponsored by the Halton Environmental Network, spraying an insect uh, a herbicide to get rid of the um the weeds is not what you want to do it's not good for the garden it's not good for our health um all of that leaches down through the soil uh when it rains and when you water and um it's just not good um and listen i do there's one more question here that i had in advance which is about the um an amelanchier that had rust and um that's the service berry i love this plant i think it's a great woodland uh shrub large shrub that has the most incredible white blossoms in early spring um the key with with uh, you know disease like rust on a plant like this is really to clean it up to prune out all of the affected branches to remove all of the leaves um, they can't really, they shouldn't really go in the compost. I know that you can read about it, um, but they shouldn't really go in the compost. They should actually go in the garbage. And uh, because you don't want the rust to, the disease to spread. Um, but now in the spring is the time to make sure that that does not re you know, reappear on your, on your shrub this summer. So, you know, clean up the shrub, clean up the plant, the ground beneath it. Uh, prune out some of the branches that you know have died and are not looking great. Um, and then there, here's a classic example. Don't sprinkle, don't run the sprinkler over top of the leaves. Water it from down below. Okay, perfect. Um, one last question. So uh, Leslie has a shade, part shade garden, and someone recommended using clover to repla replace the grass. So not growing in the shade, what do you think? 
I, uh, I don't think that's a great um, solution. Um, I don't think they'd, you'd be happy. Now, there are some grass seeds that have a mix of clover in it. So that's certainly what I would try. I would buy, you know, grass seed that is specifically for shade. Um, and I would try that first before going to all clover. Um, and sometimes you just, you know, I know some gardens in the, on the north, you know, who are, who have north exposure and then the, you know, a big tree shading it. So there's, you know, double whammy, no sun whatsoever. It's pretty darn tough. Um, and I would suggest perhaps then um, really saving up to do artificial turf because I know, I know it sounds really crazy and the hen probably will hate me for this, but it does work and um, it does work and it does look good. So, you know, in the short term or in the long term, if you have a problem with no shade in your back garden and you really want some grass, you know, the, gra the fact is grass is one of the most um, ineffective plants we have. I mean, we, we have to water it, so we're wasting water. We've got to fertilize it, so we got to, you know, and we've used herbicides on it. I mean, geez, from an environmental perspective, we shouldn't really have grass anywhere, but we do, and we've become used to it, and so um, it's a, about learning to live with it. Mm -hmm. Well, Nancy, thank you very much. You have been a wealth of information. I'm sure everybody got something out of this webinar. It has been a tremendous help to all of us gardeners out here. <laughs> well, regardless of whether we're stuck at home with COVID or not, this has just been a fountain of information. So I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions and you know how to get a hold of me, don't, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I'd love to throw this back to my friend Lisa, Lisa Kohler, who, from Hen, who invited me to do this, who twisted my arm uh, to get me to do this. I don't, it was, it was my pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, so much. Oh my gosh, I learned a ton. Thank you, Nancy. We're having some requests to have you again, so I'm sure you and I will be chatting later about that. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Lisa. I'm from the Halton Environmental Network, and thank you very much for joining us today on the most amazing call with Nancy Robertson. It was awesome. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we do have a website, oakfulready.ca. Uh, we will be posting this webinar uh, to that website in about 24 hours, so you can rewatch it, take notes, uh, et cetera. There's some other webinars, too, that might be of interest to you, so please check out our website. If you go to oaklaready.ca under general resources webinars, you will see all of the previous webinars that we have recorded. In addition, tomorrow we're super excited about the heart of Oakville Beats On. Uh, this is a call that we're doing uh, with the town of Oakville. Uh, They're going to be talking to community groups and others that are actually making a difference every day through the COVID pandemic and building in resiliency and talking about how Oakville gives back and such a great community to live in and to work in. And I'm really excited about these positive stories that we'll be discussing tomorrow. So if you can join us, that's tomorrow again at 1 p.m. If you have an idea for a community call, please remember, reach out uh, to us. You can get a hold of Trisha Henderson at trisha.henderson at oakville.ca or myself, Lisa Kay at haltedenvironmental.ca. Thank you everyone again for joining us. It was a great webinar. We look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe, be well, and thank you again.